So we will be taking up four items that were moved to the end of the calendar this morning. We'll be taking up both on page 16. Stancom Report 579-10. House Bill number 2376, House Draft 3, which is the Board of Education Constitutional Amendment. And on page 22, House Standing Committee Report number 645-10, House Bill 2377, House Draft 3, which is, the which is the statutory language for the Board of Ed reorganization. So we'll be taking up those two measures at one time since they both are related to one another. Okay. Oh, Representative Tokioka, yes. Yes, Mr. Speaker, I rise on a point of inquiry. State your point of inquiry. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, we've been in this um, co chamber since uh, roughly 10 o'clock deliberating on bills. And um, I noticed something different from the entire day. Um, I noticed that there was an additional camera in the room today, Mr. Speaker. So my yes. inquiry is um, if this camera is public record, if um, I as a member can ask for a copy of that, I know that there are six other cameras in this uh, chamber that are used by Capital TV that um, we budget 175000 for. We split with the Senate. That's about 85000 um, But I do know when we ask for um, uh, proceeding, hearings on the proceedings that we get that information. So I would just like to uh, make that point of inquiry, Mr. Speaker. The point of inquiry, members of the House, is to ask the, shall we have a short recess? Then you can make a response. Recess subject to the call of the chair. caucus has been using two tape um, is privately owned and members of the house please be seated An inquiry was posed by one of our majority members, and the majority leader will respond to the inquiry that was posed to the members of this body. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I appreciate the question and for clarification. Mr. Speaker, um, one of the reason, well, let me just start off by saying that uh, any, at least that equipment or equi equipment that the minority caucus has been using to tape um, is privately owned and is, um, is, is pretty much from these public cameras not being able to really use them when we are trying to uh, do either YouTubes or communicate with our districts. Um, and so on our own and with the uh, personal funds of some of our really dedicated uh, employees, they decided to purchase equipment and use that to, um, to record events. Uh, I would just also like to just add that I think it's very important that we remain as a body as open as possible, in fact, open to the public, very transparent, and I think that this allows us to do so. Thank you. Thank you very much. So has she responded to your inquiry, Representative Tokioka? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, I guess we can take that answer, but being open, as I mentioned earlier, we have six cameras in here. 
and they have pretty good angles of the room, so I think that's kind of open. As I, and as I said, we spend $85,000 a year on, on uh, providing information to the public. I think that's um, sufficient. Thank, Thank you. Thank you Mr. very much. Speaker. Okay. Mr. Speaker, I'm just wondering, why does this concern him that we're recording it with personal equipment? Even if it is being paid, other equipment is being paid by the, um, by the body and the Senate. It is equipment that is personally owned that is being uh, that is recording so that is y being used to record our sessions so that we can communicate to our districts of what took place we can't use the uh the videotape that is uh, point used of order mr speaker can representative we, this is not a debate can we uh take this offline and not on the record and in the journal mr and speaker this i believe that R R your members on that the side will recognize started the conversation and, and implied that it was wrong to do so i believe Okay, did you finish Thank your you. comments? The inquiry was posed primarily because some of the members felt that if it was public monies, it should be open to the members of this body. Since it is private sources that have been used to acquire the property and the equipment, it is the right of the GOP or the Republican Minority Caucus to do that. All he inquired was because he wanted to find out if it was privately bought or publicly bought. If it was publicly bought, then I think we would have a decision that it should be shared among all members of this body. Mr. Speaker? Mr. Speaker, I agree, Repres except for the second comment had nothing Mr. to do Speaker, with that. Representative, I, I stood first. Representative and I asked Tokyo. The question first. If I offended anyone, I m meant no offense by that. I just inquired, I wasn't accusing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Okay, thank you very much. Shall we proceed on, members of the House, at this point in time, to the four end of calendar measures? Person Blake O'Shiro. Mr. Speaker, I move for the adoption of standing committee reports numbers 579-10 and 645-10 as listed on pages 16 and 22, respectively, and that the accompanying House bills as amended pass third reading. Representative Cindy Evans. Mr. Speaker, I second the motion. Okay, members, can we go on to page 16? The first measure was the Board of Education Constitutional Amendment. Any discussion? Representative Suki, by, followed by Representative Finnegan. Yes, Mr. Speaker, I, I am opposed to this measure. Please proceed. I believe that uh, the request for a constitutional amendment to change the composition of the board is an overreaction because of the furlough Friday. And I believe that the, the impetus is too much in haste and not enough thought. We have another bill, and I will gonna uh, reserve my remarks uh, at, for the the second bill that we're going to be hearing. But in regard to the, to the constitutional amendment, I don't believe we need an amendment now. We may need it in the future after we have a lot of talk. I would like to see a, a committee being, uh, being, being set up by you and the president of the Senate to study this during the interim, come back uh, to the legislature next, uh, next year and come up with a recommendation that will give enough time for people to, uh, to settle down and not get into the fervor of uh, furlough Fridays. In respect to the four, to the three governors, I served with all three of them in different times, of course, and I don't remember any of them coming up with any recommendation for changes in the educational system or in the board system. So it was quite a surprise to me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Representative Finnegan. Mr. Speaker, um, I know we're taking up two issues, but f so first I would like to be very clear on my votes on the bo both issues. Yes. Um, on SCR 579, the Constitutional Amendment Board of Education, I will be voting with reservations. Okay, thank and you very much. for the 
other bill, I'm sorry, I don't Secretary have Secretary Language Changes. Uh, yes. Uh, that bill, I will be voting no. Okay. Uh, Mr. Speaker, on the first constitutional amendment question, uh, first of all, I, I, I did want to provide some comments on what the previous speaker said. Please if proceed. I'm not mistaken, and I, I didn't research this, but if I'm not mistaken, Governor Cayetano actually did a re blue ribbon report, I think, and it was uh, recommending local school boards, I think. I can't remember, but I, I think I remember something like that. Um, anyway, the constitutional amendment on this particular Board of Education, uh, the minority has offered us few, uh, a couple bills, and we offered a very similar bill to this, but instead we said to abolish the board. And the governor had also introduced a bill that said to abolish the board and replace it with um, the superintendent being appointed and being a cabinet member of the governor. And the reason why I'm with reservations is as this, mo as this moves forward, um, I would rather like to see that the constitutional amendment is more like the governor's where it talks it, it focuses in on direct accountability and responsibility through the governor um, so i'd rather see that speaking on the second bill that we're taking up it has to do with the implementation language i guess um, and this one gets a little confusing for me and that's why i'm voting no it what we what we, w what I hope everybody wants here is more accountability within the system. And what you have in the bill is it creates a council. And this council has representation that is, um, uh, I guess, appointed by different members of, the, of different groups. Well, what happens in this case is, to me, it gets, again, more gray on whether or not the governor has direct accountability or responsibility of the education system. You go through a council, and I know it's modeled after the Board of, Ed, uh, Board of Regents, but you go through a council, and then after you go th to that council, then you know they recommend to the governor, and of course she gets to choose, and then it goes down to advice and consent with the Senate. Mr. Speaker, I think it's really important that we keep that line very direct from the governor to appointing the superintendent, and if there should be a board, to appointing the board, because that would be much clearer for accountability. Um, some people are worried about the ability to, you know, have community involvement, and if we truly want community involvement, I think that that direct um, accountability with the governor and appointing a superintendent as well as uh, appointing the possible board members that you would get accountability and then you could push the decision making down and decentralize to where it matters where it, that's at the school level and going further into that we passed a tool called weighted student formula in act 51 where we're supposed to or i would like to see most of the money, at least 90, 70, 80, and then 90 percent to the classroom level, because the way I put it is those with the gold will make the rules, and then they will have the ability to have decentralization at the school level to make the decisions that they need to do to prioritize the spending, to prioritize their needs, to meet the needs of the student. Mr. Speaker, I think that that's what we need to do for, um, for our keiki, so that we can as much as possible, um, avoid stuff like furlough Fridays. It's really giving that community of community, principal, and teachers the ability to make the decisions and prioritize the way that they're going to be spending that money. And then clear direction from the uh, governor and an appointed superintendent by the governor and an appointed board, if that's how it ends up being, by the governor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any further discussion? Representative Kenito? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I need a ruling on, on conflict. State your conflict. Uh, my daughter works for the Board of Ed. No conflict. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion? Representative Villati. Thank you. Uh, in strong support for House Bill 2376 HD3, and I request to insert any comments. Okay. So ordered. Representative Suki, second, second time. Yes, Mr. Speaker. I. If I get get into the second phase of it, please, I please proceed. We're taking two at, a, at one um, time. Okay. In regard to uh, the Board of Education, 
I believe that the governor, the, the, the governance system that we have right now is overly centralized at this point. We have one of the most centralized government in the whole United States. It's a huge responsibility for one person and it kind of reflects in some degree as to what is going on right now. The education budget is approximately three billion dollars. More than half of our annual budget. Now to expect one person one governor is also responsible for health, also responsible for human services, also responsible for transportation, which include highways, harbors, airport, board of education. All of that, besides the tons of committees that we also have to be responsible for all of that and to be able to keep track of everything. It's very difficult for one person, become very dependent on many, many people, and that become very subjective as they get up to the governor. Now I would like to see a continual electoral system. There's no better accountability than an elected accountability. The present system that we have right now, the, the board is too uh, small. It doesn't provide uh, accountability for different districts in Honolulu. It doesn't provide accountability for its individual island, each neighbor island. In the island of Maui, you're combined with two or three out of islands. There is no accountability there for that particular representative. I mean, the, uh, the board member. I think if we reconstitute the board, and this is why I would want a, a deliberate effort during the summertime, during the interim, to look as to what kind of board that we need, what size, how many people do we need. And in the end, it could be that we want an appointed board. But not now. We're not ready for it right now. This is in too much haste that we're doing this. So let's sit back. But remember this, there's nothing more accountable than an elected person to his electorate, not to an appointed board who have no accountability. Yes, the governor is, is accountable. But when you have individual board members respecting their particular district, and they're accountable to that district, you know that they're gonna be the best, they, they could do the best they can so they can get reelected again if that is the inducement. An appointed board doesn't have that kind of inducement as an electoral uh, an election board. So, so members, all I ask of you is to kind of lay back a little bit, don't be hasty, don't have to act on it right now. The board is not doing that better job where the whole world is going to fall apart. So just wait a little bit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. McKelvey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In opposition to both measures. Okay, so ordered. Uh, may I have the words of the speaker from Wailuku enter to the record as if they were my own? So ordered. And I just kind of, um, some brief comments if I may. I know it's getting late. I'm just kind of, uh, um, I guess, taken aback by the the, pos the Republican position because just a few years ago their position of the party seemed to be for locally uh, local school boards and now they're going towards one person in the governor's cabinet. I think that's going completely in the opposite direction of accountability. But back to the bills themselves, I agree with the Speaker Emeritus. I think what we need to do is use this, look at this issue, but I think at the end of the day we have to have a serious conversation in the off session about locally elected school boards. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any further discussion? Representative Takumi. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In support of both measures and uh, just a quick response to some of the comments that have been made on the floor. I do realize that uh, there is no silver bullet when it comes to education reform and it is true. 
that the research that relates student achievement or the potential for increased student achievement and the governance model of a particular state or school district, district there really is no bright line nexus. But that said, I do believe this approach is worth a try. Now, let me comment on a couple of things and taking off from just what the previous speaker said. It's very interesting to me that the administration proposed initially this year a bill to abolish the board so we would follow two other states with no state board of education and have a, if you will, an education czar, a cabinet member, a one-person school board and department head all rolled into one. And this is coming on the heels in 2004 of uh, proposing at least seven local elected school board. Now, I don't want to rehash that one, but needless to say, in that bill, if you recall, for those of us who are here, those seven local school boards could also morph into other school boards, sort of like a, you know, bad petri dish experiment. They could just kind of morph and divide and go on. And um, if you if you look at uh, the 15,000 school districts in our country, average size 2,500 students, which is about the size of Campbell High School or Farrington High School, that would mean we would have about 70 locally elected school boards. So the intent of the design and the hope at that time was that you would have this local grassroots elected by the people, let the people decide, that sort of thing. And now the governor has proposed consoling that, consolidating all of that into one person. So philosophically, the premise to me is diametrically opposed, but that notwithstanding, to respond to the speaker from Maui, Speaker Meris, yes, maybe we ought to think about this and put some thought into it, but there have been permutations of an, elect, an appointed board and an appoint elected board introduced many times over the years. Now, none of them during my time actually made it to the ballot, but we have put before the people of the state after we b became an elected board in 1964, two times whether or not we should have an appointed board. The bill itself, Mr. Speaker, the Constitutional Amendment Bill, merely says, shall there be an appointed board so appointed by the governor, subject to Senate confirmation, and all the rest will be decided by law. So the concern expressed by the Speaker Emeritus, we will be able to take care of if the voters of this state decide, if it indeed is put on the ballot, if they decide we will have an appointed board, we have the underlying bill, but that bill, again, it will be subjected to law. We can make changes. Right now, the bill says eight members, one student non-voting member, seven appointed members, one from Kauai, one from the Big Island, one from Maui, and three from, four from Oahu, four, that's right, four from Oahu. That can change. We can change it because, again, it will be determined by law. The terms, the staggering, all the rest. Last point, Mr. Speaker, when we talk about the University of Hawaii, and this bill to some degree is mirrored after the Board of Regents and the way they are done, but keep in mind in this bill, the governor appoints a chair, nominates a chair of the Board of Education. That is not true with the Board of Regents. The Board of Regents, now let's keep in mind the University of Hawaii, over 80 plus percent of that budget is paid for by taxpayers, and yet it is appointed by the governor as a result of a selection council, and it seems to have worked well. It seems to me we ought to at least try that with the K-12 system and see whether or not that works well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Representative Chin. And thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just uh, reservations on both measures. So ordered. With them, um, I, I wish to have some remarks entered in the journal. Yes. Um, but I did just want to say, you know, um, it was commented um, about uh, <coughs> the minority caucus and, and positions. What we just know is that what is now isn't working as it should. It's not working to the to the level that we know we can. And um, it's so um, easy to become sweeping about concepts as an election, but the reality is, is that whereas perhaps in our legislative elected positions, people know who their representative is, and even then I wonder sometimes, or their senator, the reality is, is that when asked, I think most of our people, our voters, really don't know who their Board of Education person is. So in terms of the accountability, not all you know, fruit are the same. It's apples and oranges sometimes. And that's the thing. Being a former educator, there are nuances. You know, it's almost, it, you have to be so aware of, of the fine line and some of the things that work. But we know that what is going on right now doesn't work. So let's move 
let's shift and let's try something else. And we, I think we need to do it right away. I think if you talk to your constituents. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any further discussion? Representative Ward followed by Chris Lee. Speaker, arise with reservation. On both measures, on please. On both measures. Um, Mr. Speaker, when you live in a roundhouse, you can never be cornered. It's impossible. It's structured in such a way you cannot be cornered. Uh, I, I think the other analogy or metaphor is uh, Congressman Abercrombie said, uh, the present structure of education is like a rectangular firing squad. We're all aiming at each other. And I think maybe a little bit we're already doing that on the floor here. But the bottom line is accountability, checks and balances. If something doesn't happen, you know, Americans are very pragmatic people. If it doesn't work, let's change it. But speaker from governors Ariyoshi, Cayetano, Waihe'e, to Lingle, who basically together signed a proclamation, let's do something different, one of which is this bill, let's get an appointment of the uh, Board of Education so we can tweak it and try it to see if it works any better than what we're doing. Because right now it's not working very well, Mr. Speaker. Everybody will admit that. But we got to get off the dime. Now, this is not the perfect uh, explanation. Uh, the governor putting it into a czar or one person is a compromise to what maybe seven years ago she was kind of pushed back, knocked down, and otherwise saying, don't you dare decentralize. Don't you dare put your communities in charge of these schools. And that went out the window. But Mr. Speaker, each of us represent a district. We got 25, 30,000 people that we have to report to. And if we're not doing our jobs, we're out of here. Right? In the Board of Education, if we represented all of Oahu, who would know from where what was being done by whom? It wouldn't happen. So if we break it down into smaller pieces, on the election. advocates of all structures made by the representative from Wailuku as well as uh, you're going to be in serious trouble thank, thank you. you very much for your support with reservations representative Chris Lee thank you speaker I just wanted to follow up um, in support um, I understand the comments made by the representative from Wailuku as well as uh, the education chair. Um, I did want to say, actually following up on the representative from Liliha's comments earlier, uh, ironically in the Finance Committee, while we were debating these bills, I um, just for fun pulled the audience, and this was an audience of education advocates of all stripes, uh, whether or not they could name the Board of Education member in their area, and less than half the audience could, which I think is telling, considering uh, I would bet that they'd not be able to mention anything else about any positions these people Board. Uh, the fact originally was that not there was no geographic requirements. Uh, finance cleaned it up. In fact, it's uh, it's a great bill. Um, my only my only concern, and I know we can work on this as we move through um, uh, the process, even after the voters of this state hopefully approve this uh, constitutional amendment. My only concern is that there are people out there that uh, are still pushing for the student on the Board of Education to be voting. I support a voting student on the Board of Education. However, I think the way that it's crafted will allow us to work on this as we go through the process. Uh, a few years ago, you know, we, we passed the voting. This bill, I think you have a, a little bit more um, accountability with the appointed chair uh, by the next governor or, or future governors. Simple bill that comes through this um, session, it's never entered perfectly, it's never filed perfectly. on the procurement that said they couldn't handle it. Mr. Speaker, not only that, but we had a, uh, another part of the bill was about principal contracts. 
tracks are nowhere off into being approved. Went to uh, went through the house and said, "How come you're not in school?" He said, "Well, I went and had breakfast and came home. Didn't know he's supposed to go to class, you know." So, when you start talking about regional school boards, uh, the people that I represent drive a hundred miles to work, round trip each day. They're gone during the daylight hours. You can't expect them to get involved closely to the schools, and so we need some central control in order to make sure that the rural guys don't just fall off the map. But let me tell you, on the bright side, I'm always encouraged by the, the kind of scholarships that the kids from Ka'u High School end up with. And I'll, and I'll use my granddaughter as an example. She graduated from Honoka High School, dysfunctional school, graduated with honors, graduated from George Washington University in three years with honors, so she obviously learned something. So the other thing I say to parents is look in the mirror. Thank you very much in support of the two measures. Any further discussion, members of the House? If not, <coughs> Representative Cindy Evans for the vote. Thank you, Speaker. On the two measures before us, on, uh, found on page 16, Standing Committee Report 57910, House Bill 2376, House Draft 3. Okay. Uh, the following representatives vote no. Representatives Awana. Representatives Awana. Carol. Hano Hano. McKelvey. Rhodes. And Suki. And then found on page 22. Standing Committee Report 645-10, House Bill 2377, House Draft 3. The following representatives vote no. Representative Zawana, Carol, Hanahano, McKelvey, Rhodes, and Suki. Okay, thank you very much, Representative Fine. Yes, on the same measures, all minority members vote aye, with the exception of the following. On SCR 645, Representative Finnegan votes no. Okay, has everyone's votes been cast at this point in time? All right, said House bills passed third reading. Members, can we move on to page 28? House Bill 2963, the Emergency and Budget Reserve Fund. Representative Blake Oshiro. Mr. Speaker, I move that House Bill number 2963, as listed on page 28, pass third reading. Representative Evans. Mr. Speaker, I second the motion. Any discussions, members of the House? Representative John Mizuno. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in support. House Bill 2963. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The rainy day fund was created by this legislature in 1999 for the use of times, for the use in times of emergency. The purpose of the fund was to maintain levels of programs determined to be essential, such as public safety, health, welfare, and education. According to the school calendar on the Department of Education website, the regular calendar would have count amounted to 184 school days prior to the furloughs. With the furloughs, Mr. Speaker, the total number of instructional days for the 2009-2010 school year will be 163. 163 instru instructional days represents the lowest number of school days in the nation. This is not acceptable. Therefore, using part of the rainy day fund for education would be in the parameters for what this fund was established for. However, I humbly request that members view this fund as 
a source of funding, not the only source of funding for education, and that members be open, remain open to the use of this fund for health care and human services also. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Any further discussion? Representative Bilotti. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ruling on a potential conflict. State your conflict. My law firm is representing a class of students who are um, trying to end the furlough Fridays. No conflict. Thank you. Any further discussion? Representative Chris Lee. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Written comments and support, please. So ordered. Representative Suki, followed by Representative Yamani. All right, Mr. Speaker, I guess I, I keep on banging my head against the wall. Uh, I'm for this measure with reservation. Please proceed. And I understand the need for this. Uh, it's, it's for emergency purposes like we have now. However, the problem that I have is the bond market has, has already stated that if we use the, um, using the emergency fund and the hurricane funds could jeopardize our bond rating. That's number one. Number two is that uh, this money, even though it's going to the general fund and going into uh, the, uh, the, uh, the appropriations, I would imagine in a budget will be for education. However, it is well known that this $50 million is, is to uh, remedy the, the furlough problem that we have now. And that's a very noble thing. However, unless the situation is resolved between uh, the governor, the Board of Education, and the union, if the money is appropriated, and if it's not resolved and the money appropriated, it's very likely, very likely that the governor will restrict the money. If the governor restricts the money, that's money that could be used for something else. Could be used for human services. Could be used for health. But this money then will be just laying idle by the governor, if no agreement is reached between the union, the board, and the governor. This is a fact. So, so members, think about that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Representative uh, Yamani, followed by Pine. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Standing up in support with reservations. Please proceed uh, with your reservations. Brief comments, Mr. Speaker, regarding my reservations. Um, you know, again, I, I try to address this budget shortfall and making sure our students get the appropriate education and education time is one of the major things that we need to address this legislative session. But Mr. Speaker, um, I do want to express some caution in regards to using the emergency and budget reserve fund. You know, Mr. Speaker, um, it is accurate that the, um, in the fund it addressed that you can maintain levels of programs with this money for essential public health safety, welfare, and education, Mr. Speaker. However, in, this, um, in the legislation, it also says that the fund ca cannot be used to fund cost items in any collective bargaining contract. So I understand the method of moving the money from the rainy day fund to general fund to be used to address this collective bargaining issue of uh, furlough days. However, Mr. Speaker, during, as we face these economic situations, we, are, we really have to address the shortfalls in our health and human service programs and pitting potential um, programs that address Kapuna care, Keiki care um, with issues of furloughs and teachers I think is a bad uh, policy issue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Representative Pine. Just support with reservations and uh, I'd like to just use the, the words of the two previous speakers as my own. So ordered. Is there any further discussion? Representative Ching, followed by Manahan. Um, with reservations and written comments, please. So ordered. Thank you very much. Representative Manahan. Thank you. Um, with reservations and also the same request as the uh, representative from uh, Ever Beach. Thank you. Can Minority. you restate, restate your request? Yeah. 
uh, support with reservations, but the uh, same request as the uh, minority floor leader. Insert my comments as uh, from the representatives from Wailuku and Mililani. So ordered. Thank you. Let's award. Speaker, I rise in support. Please proceed. Speaker, I think it boils down to basically political will and a matter of priorities. I think the chair of health brings up a technical difficulty. Uh, there's not really any difficulty in changing that particular uh, collective bargaining, uh, whatever that kind of outlaws the use of that particular fund. But we have to get our priorities straight, Speaker. Uh, the representative from Maui said we spend $3 billion on education. I think we throw in the University of Hawaii. You could probably say that. That means as policymakers, our best and biggest and most important policy is education, if you follow the money, right? So, Mr. Speaker, we've got to end these furloughs. This is a beginning, even if it's a negotiated beginning, it's a time to sit down and say, look, are we going to have a priority? We're not going to have a priority. Do we really believe in the education of our kids or not? Fish or cut bait? Get on with it or not get on with it? And this is the one, regardless of all the other needs that we have, that we've got to prioritize. And this is the beginning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there any further discussion at this point? Representative Finnegan. Mr. Speaker, in opposition to this bill. In opposition, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, I am taking a very hard line on this. From the beginning, I said that I wasn't going to vote for rating the hurricane, uh, I'm sorry, rating the rainy day fund for uh, education and, and, and this collective bargaining um, agreement. Mr. Speaker, I feel like the system is holding the students hostage. You know, you're not gonna get education unless you, you fund them wholly raise taxes, do whatever you need to, but you have to fund them wholly. We can't even identify what is adequate funding, even in good times, in our budget. Number one, I believe that this enables the broken system. Number two, I want to adopt the, the words from Speaker uh, Emeritus from Maui, as well as the, um, the words from the Chair of Health for their reasons. So ordered. Thank you. And Mr. Speaker, also remember that this is the board that when they're given suggestions to cut, that they can't make those decisions. The suggestions to cut from the Department of Education, that they can't make those decisions. In fact, they're the very ones that sent us over legislation because they couldn't do it as a board. They sent us the legislation that told us to ban you know, milk, uh, ice cream, and candy. Mr. Speaker, they should be able to find at least some of the money to pay for furlough Fridays within the existing two point something billion dollars. The largest budget for a department that we have. In turn, we, as in the other departments and the state, suffer in small departments like agriculture or DLNR. These budgets are so small and you're squeezing them because for the sake of education, for the protection of education. When we need to look at that and we say, oh, you mean you're talking about this whole two point something billion dollars that you cannot and will not cut enough to pay for furlough Fridays. Teachers and principals know that there is waste in the Department of Education. They understand priorities, and they understand that furlough Fridays and instructional time is a number one priority. But yet, all these other things are being funded before that. Mr. Speaker, we have to make hard choices. That's what we're being asked to do. And as much as I want to end furlough Fridays, I cannot continue to sit or stand here enabling a broken system that won't look within itself or doesn't have the ability to look within itself or have the board members that will make the tough decisions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Is there any further discussion? If not, the chair recognizes Reverend Cindy Evans. Thank you, Speaker. 
Found on page 28, we have Standing Committee Report 510-10, House Bill Number 2963. On this measure, all majority members vote aye, with one exception, Representative Cabanilla votes no. Okay, Representative Fine. Yes, on the same measure, all minority members vote aye, with the exception of a no vote from Representative Finnegan. Okay, has everyone's votes been cast at this point in time? Okay, said House bill passes third reading. <coughs> Members, can we move to page 31, House Bill 2737, House Draft 1. Members will defer to the end, will defer one legislative day. Person Blake will Cheryl. Okay, we'll defer one legislative day to tomorrow. So, Madam Clerk, are there any resolutions for action at this point? Mr. Speaker, there are no resolutions for action today. May all others be referred to print. So, ordered members, are there any announcements this evening? If there is no announcements, the chair recognizes Representative Evans. Mr. Speaker, I move this House stand adjourned until 12 noon tomorrow. Representative Pine. I second the motion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. The motion is carried. The House stands adjourned until 12 noon tomorrow. Thank you. tomorrow at 12 o'clock noon. The House session has adjourned for the day. Session will convene tomorrow at 12 o'clock noon. Mahalo. Hair loss. Now this rash on my face, what's going on? For answers, ask your doctor the right question.